bless your name and you'll be glorified in Jesus name five to ten years ago if we all remember there were there were this movement of people that came and they were talking about the word of God and they called themselves I'll say motivational speakers and their motivational speakers I have nothing against motivational speakers but we were replacing motivational speakers with pastors with people that preach the word of God with not just with disciples of the word of God and they got this foundation from Ephesians 3.20 where it says now unto him that is able to do immensely more than we can ever ask or imagine and they kept on saying things like um, the, the Bible says we can ask, let's pray or imagine, that means if I imagine, if I think if I think hard, God will show up how many of us remember that movement and they said, dummies were not thinking see people that have money they don't know Jesus and they have money people that don't know Jesus they, they, they are moving things they are, they are having says in what happens and then this went on for a very long time but the thing about um, motivational speaking and the thing about um, people that just say facts is that at the end of the day the only thing that stands is the truth when you remove the word of God from situations and from things it will tell after a certain period of time the thing about life is that you can have self-help books it only helps the word it only helps interpret the word the first thing you should always know first and foremost as a child of God is the word so what do you do you read the word for yourself you study the Bible for yourself and say what is this saying what is it saying about this thing then you now start reading um, you now start with commentaries you start reading Bible and um, books that help the Bible but the first thing the first reference point is the Bible do we understand what I'm saying so in when that movement started the culture of praying now regressed because they said if I ask that if I pray or if I imagine why would I have to ask if I can just imagine I can imagine sleeping I can imagine standing I can imagine as I'm working and then the spirit of hustling came in place and replaced the culture of prayer but the truth of the matter is from a place of prayer that you can imagine it's from a place of prayer that you can see what God is saying. It's from a standpoint of prayer that you know what he's talking about. Because Pinostus is the divine understanding, divine revelation of what God is saying. That means that from a place of prayer, I can see what God is saying. This is what Jesus was referring to when he said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. He had an understanding from a place of spending time with Jesus. If you don't spend time with Jesus, you can't think like he's thinking. If I keep spending time, um, before I got married, I was a talker, I was aggressive, I was, you know, fire. My husband is the total opposite. He's calm, he said he's very correct, you know, and then, for some reason, my head now started being correct. My parents were like grateful. They said, we knew there was a reason why this man was in your life. You chose well, you know. After a while, you start being like that person, amen? That's when you spend time with the person. But you can't tell me you know me when you never spent time with me. You can never tell me you know me when all you've done is meet me for the first time. All you did meet me on Sunday for, let's say, two, three hours. You don't know me. So. The church was missing that part of prayer, and then we put prayer at the back seat. And so now I'm talking about two cultures today. I'm talking about the culture of prayer and the culture of testimony, which we call love here. Amen? And then the truth of the matter is that if the church stops interceding, when I say prayer, I mean interceding. Interceding means standing in the gap for yourself and for other people. That's the work, that's our job. We're not here for me. There's a reason why I'm on the earth. I'm not a waste of time. He didn't do, he didn't put me on earth to keep Tochuku company. He put me on earth for a reason. Tochuku as company is just an added advantage. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So if I'm here for a reason, I need to find that purpose and reason or else I'm wasting time. 
I'm wasting his time and I'm wasting other people's time that is affected by that reason. Yeah? And then he goes and says, um, and I was, I was talking to one of my children, I said, if the church stops praying and we stop interceding for our community and for the nation, wickedness will always supersede. Wickedness will always continue. If we stop praying and interceding for our community and nation, we would always be in a state of, oh my God, this country again, this country again, until we stand in the gap and begin to raise our voices and say, because we are in this place, this cannot happen. Why? Because I'm in Nigeria. This cannot happen. Until we come to that place, we would always allow things that we don't want to happen. So interceding is standing in the gap. Because if in Romans 8, 19, it says that the earth is waiting for the uh, manifestation of the sons of, the, of God, another verse says they are eagerly expecting the revelation of the sons of God. That means they're expecting us to do something. What are they expecting us to do? They're expecting us to show them the way and lead them the way. If we don't know the road, how can we lead them? And we know it from a place of revelation, understanding and his place with him, spending time with him. We can never underestimate the culture of prayer. As spirit beings, we dwell and manifest from a place of prayer. We are spirit beings. And so, if we are waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, what, does, what, what are sons? Sons are people that have the DNA of their father. And ours is crazier because he said, greater things shall he do. So if Jesus raised the dead, he's expected that from here, everybody should start rising up from their graves. If I declare it. He said, greater things shall he do. That means I will walk into a place and I will say, this sick begin to walk. This lame begin to walk. This blind begin to see. And I'm expectant that it happens. I'm not saying, I'm just saying, I'm saying, oh, it will happen, it may not happen. At the end of the day, the will of the Lord will be fine. No. He said, greater things shall he do. That means I will do more than my father. He's such a good father that he gives us more than he has. He said that should give you so much confidence. I remember um, my goddaughter was saying to me that she wants to ask her daddy for an airplane. I said, come, let's go and ask him. I said, where will we park? I said, where will we park? I said, aeroplane. They said, $40,000 a day to park aeroplane. Your father has money. Come, let's go and ask him. Because to a child, the father can do and buy anything. The faith has not been tarnished. So me, that day, there was a problem in the house because I said, let us go and ask for this aeroplane. So every time I come, have you asked for the aeroplane? Say, I've been asking. He's not giving me the aeroplane. I said, okay, ask for a Mercedes Benz. Let's ask for a Mercedes Benz. Let's reduce it. Let's ask in her mind, her father can do all things. And if we're supposed to have the heart of children, our father can do all things. Our father can do all things. And so we must have so much confidence in the father because he said, greater things shall he do. Greater things I ex I'm expected to do. And Elijah knew, Elijah knew this in the book of 1 Kings 18, 41 to 45. No problem. First Kings 18, 41 to 45, I'll just summarize. This was basically when God had said um, there will now be rain, and then Elijah was the prophet of Baal, and then he had the poured water, and then fire consumed the sacrifice. Can you remember the story? Fire consumed the sacrifice. And then this point from 41 to 45 is when Elijah now says, okay, you know what? There's going to be rain. And I hear the sound of abundance of rain. He didn't hear it with his ordinary ears. If not, everybody would have joined him to hear the sound of abundance of rain. He heard it from a place of understanding after his walk with God that I hear the sound of abundance of rain. And what did he do? The Bible says that immediately he said, he had to go and drink. Go and rest, go and enjoy yourself. I hear the sound of abundance of rain. What did Elijah do? Elijah went to Mount Carmel to go and pray. He said something. And he went to Mount Carmel to go and pray. He went to Mount Carmel because he had to separate himself. Two, he had to be at an advantage point. When you separate yourself, you are at an advantage point. Because now you can hear without any distractions. So he went and he separated himself. And he went to Mount Carmel and he started praying. He had went to go and drink. Do you know why he went to go and drink and, and rejoice? He went to do that because 
Before Elijah had said there will be no rain, it came to pass. Now he has said there will be rain, it has to come to pass. When we say that we're children of God, and people look at us and they say, okay, you're a child of God, whatever you say is what should be. So he goes and he prays, and then he tells the servant, we are going to check if rain is falling. The servant goes and comes back and says, man, yeah, nothing's happening there. He goes back again, he goes back, he prays again. How far can I check if something's happening? He says, man, yeah, nothing's happening there. He goes back again. He said, go and check. I'm sure the servant was like, what is going on? Nothing is happening there. At some point, I'm sure he probably stayed at the other end. I was like, nothing is happening here. Nothing is happening here. Nothing is happening here. At some point, if it was some of us, we would have been tired. We would have said, maybe it's not the will of God that it should rain. We would have started giving understanding for what God is saying. We would have started giving maybe, 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 maybe for what God is saying. But because he had come from a place of knowledge and divine knowledge of God through a place of prayer, he knew that maybe what is happening is the first time I prayed, what I was doing was, you know, remember the Bible says that we rest not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, rulers of darkness in high places. So your mother-in-law is not your problem. Your job boss is not your problem. Your problem is rulers of darkness in high places, and principalities and powers. Do you get what I'm saying? So he had come to a place where he has this understanding. So the first time he bows down his head and he raises up his head, the servant says, nothing is happening. I'm sure he didn't say the same prayer again when he was by. It's only a fool that expects to do something the same way and expect a different result. So he probably bowed down his head and said, maybe this is not the demon. Maybe this is the and power. He cramped it up a bit, knelt down and prayed. Nothing is happening. OK, no problem. He cramped it up. Maybe this is. Um, um, spiritual wickedness in high places that I'm dealing with that is holding the rain. Why? When you pray with understanding, things would always happen. When you pray just because you're praying, and you don't pray from the word of God, you will be on that mountain for a very long time. And so what happened? He kept on going and going and going and going. And then finally, at the seventh time, he said, come, what do you see? Now, at this point, the atmosphere had been charged with prayers. The servant could not see what he was seeing. The servant could not see what he was expecting. Do you know why? When you pray with expectation, people around you get activated. When you pray from a place of expectation, even the people that have lost hope around you will start gingering and start getting hope because it is a spirit. And then what did he say? He said, I see a cloud the shape of a hand. That does not sound like play. That does not sound like rain. In fact, it sounds like hurricane or something, but it does not sound like rain. But he had keyed into the spirit that was happening at that place. And he now had an understanding that, well, there was nothing before, but now there is something. Some of us will have said, I've been praying since for a miracle. And then all God just did was give me 10,000 naira. After all this prayer, I've been praying. How can I have been praying this type of prayer? And this is the small miracle that he gave me. But Elijah said, no. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. At the end of the day, oh, I was seeing nothing for the past six times. The seventh time, God showed me a sign that he will never leave me nor forsake me. He gave me a sign. He ran with it. And he said, go, go and tell you, I'm sorry, when the rain is coming. That is what he means. And then that takes me to the second culture. The second culture is the culture of testimony. We don't understand the power of testimony. If the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, that means every time I stand and testify, that spirit has been let out into the atmosphere. So for example, I've been with Mercy, let's say Mercy attends church every Sunday. Every single Sunday she comes to church and she has been believing God, let's say for the fruit of home, she has a daughter. She believes God for the fruit of the womb. And then finally she comes and she starts, praise the Lord. I just want to give God the glory and praise the Lord. I've been waiting on God for the past 150 years for the truth of the womb. And then all of a sudden, I'm pregnant. I have a husband and I'm pregnant. And I say, oh, this is a test. Oh, this is a child of God. I cannot be cut down. <laughs> And then she does oh, praise the Lord. And then she's pregnant. And then oh, the baby came out. And, oh, and then finally, this is my baby. Somebody in the, in the room 
that is looking for the same testimony, has been asking God for the same testimony, gets encouraged in the spirit that we and her have been coming to this same church every Sunday. And I was there when she was praying and crying to God every Sunday. That means that that same God that visited her can still visit me on this same role on this same Sunday. The power of testimony is so strong that it's so easy to just catch. But we downplay that culture because people don't want people to know their story. But God gave you that story for a reason. He didn't give you just because you're pretty. He gave you for a reason. Sometimes we go through things for the other person. And so I've been through this, I've been through the storm. And then at the end of the day, what do I do? I'm just quiet and I keep it to myself. You were a waste of time. So the culture of testimony has been reduced to praise the Lord. Oh, so if you go to some churches, some people say, I had a headache and the headache went. Nobody will clap for their testimony. Until you had accident, the cast of assaulted 50 times. People will stand up and clap because that one is a testimony. But we let out things every time we give testimony. Every time we give testimonies. It was like Gideon. Gideon, the first time we heard of Gideon in the Bible, First time I, um, we thought about Gideon from the Bible, in the Bible, was he was a coward. He was hiding under the basement, you know, pressing this thing and then bringing out barley. And I'm like, this is what God wants to use. Finally, God says, Come bring an army. He's still shaking. Reduce the army to 300. He's still shaking. And then God now says, in, um, in um, 1 Kings 18, He now says, Go with verse 10. He says, Go with. No, if you have, go to the camp of the enemy and go and hear what they're saying. And then you ask, okay, you know what? If you're afraid, go with, um, was it Priham? And then go with your friend. When he went, he said, if you're afraid, go with your friend. Then in 11, the Bible says, he went with the friend. He was still afraid until he got to the camp of the enemy and people were speaking testimonies about him. He now got encouraged. The Bible says he bowed down and worshiped. And guess what he did? He came back and then he said, now, people are not just going in the name of the Lord, though. People are going in the name of the Lord and in the name of Gideon. After he had been gingered, what does testimonies do? It gingers you. Now, this same Gideon had forgotten that God had saved the people of Israel from the Red Sea. He had delivered them from the Egyptians. He had brought out water from the rock. He had done so. There's nothing he had not done apart from turning them upside down. They have forgotten all those testimonies because they were not recalling all those testimonies. But once he heard a small testimony, he grabbed hold of it and he ran. Testimony gives you hope. Hope is a joyful expectation that something good is about to happen. If you have no hope, we are useless. We are lost. So testimonies give us hope. We must always encourage the culture of testimony. But the people that we are now, now I don't want anyone to know my story. They will be telling my story to other people. So I gave it as testimony in church all of a sudden. I'm hearing the testimony in other places, and it's not as testimony again. It's not as something else. It's as gossip. You know? So we've, we've, we've changed what it's supposed to be. And we are now depriving the fellow brothers and sisters from it. We don't even have to stand here and give the testimony. You can give a fellow sister. Because I see what happened to me. see what God did to me. And the thing about it is, whatever you emphasize or you magnify, so you say, see what God did to me. See what God did for me. When you thank him for more, he will multiply. Jesus said, Father, I thank you for this food. And it multiplied into 12, more than two, um, 12 baskets and uh, remaining 12 baskets. We know the story. Every time you want something to matter, you tell it. You thank for it. Thank you for it is the testimony. I'll end with this. As children of God, what we do is that we forget that if the power of testimony can change lives, that means my experience can change lives. And my experience means something. I will explain. I'll end with this. Um, in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 18, the Bible says, as soon as Zion traveled, she put forth. And I remember when I was in labor. My daughter. I've never seen that that was me before in my life. I've never been I've never been pregnant before then, but I was in labor. 
<laughs> so I said, as a medical doctor, please cut me open and bring out this child. I don't want to deliver like the Hebrew women. <laughs> they didn't put it as my middle name. <laughs> cut me open, use knife, cut it, bring out this child. Now, when you enter the labor room, you will see women, two types of women. The women that are just, mm, 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 mm. and the women that are screaming, I need this thing to get out of my body right now. Yeah. Now, most times, women that shout, I need this to get out of my body right now, are people that are doing it for the first time. Because if you have experienced labor before, you know that at the end of the day, I gave birth to a child. It's a place of understanding that makes you know that this labor is not for punishment, it is for good. Me going through a situation, it's a place of prayer that will help me understand if this is just punishment or this is labor. So what do you do? When you know it's labor, you know at the end of the day, my baby has got to come out. You know that it's just a matter of time. Sooner than later, I'm 4 cm, I'm 5 cm, I'm 6 cm, I'm 7 cm, I'm 8 cm. At 8 cm, 10 cm, if I do what I get time from 9, they come out. And then at 8 cm, I'm not saying, 8 cm dilated, I'm not saying, ah, OK, I'm not doing it again, let's go. I've come this way. This child must come out. We think most times that punishment, that when we go through trials and travails, is because, oh, it's because I was not close to God, or because I was not praying as much. It's not every time. Sometimes, it's labor. So what do you do then? You stand on the word of God. I don't know my P.O. was giving me. My P.O. was, oh, mama, this thing has got to come out. Let's cut open to They said, no, you will give birth to this child. Almost immediately, she gave birth. She started smiling. You would have forgotten the things that you went through. Were you ever in a situation where you thought this is the thing that would kill me? I remember. And then now you're laughing at it. But you know you're going to another one too. Life has not ended. But what do you do at that time when you enter another one? You remember the things that you have been through. And you stand that that same God that took me through it, that same God that took me through that is going to take me through. Why? Because it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God bless you. Um, in case you have, wherever you are, your own journey with God, and you want to ask, Pastor Shai is in the house. So answers will come. Have, um, just talking about it, I've also learned to um, not undermine the little things that God does in our lives because sometimes we get fixated on the mountain type miracles. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't see Him in the small things. But when we get to see every day as a miracle and the little things, we grow in those other things as well. Big things. And, uh, he that is faithful in little will be faithful in much. He that appreciates the little will appreciate much. Uh, gratitude is how we are called to live. The kingdom. Attitude is gratitude. Because we live not hoping that God will do it. We live knowing that he has done. And we're not fighting to, to, to end victory. We actually fight to enforce the victory that we have already received in Christ. That is the position of the gospel. You're not, you're, you're not down, you're up. You're above only, seated in heaven places in Christ Jesus. So if you, if you find yourself down, pick yourself and put yourself back in, in consciousness of where you are. So the gospel is war. You know why it says content for the faith that was given to us. We must contend because everything from news headlines to friends, a friend will come to you and say, I'm having a patch period, I'm not, my spiritual life is down, I just said, I'm having two. No, that's a, part, that's a prayer partner there. You understand? You're about to miss a prayer moment. It's not to say, my brother, at my own patch, it's been two weeks of no word or anything. No, hold his hands and both of you should cabash into the realms. Don't console yourself in, in dry season. Say, my brother, we need water. You understand? So we, we, that's our position as the gospel. So if somebody comes to you and says, um, I have migraine, don't say, I've been dealing with malaria. No, you can't. That's not the time to emphasize the hope. You say, brother, lay, your, lay hands on his head. Brother, go on your knees. Now, don't tell us to go on your knees. But whatever you're led to do, supernatural must be part of our expectation. We cannot, we live in a generation where it's so much intellectualism. Even me, I have to deal with that. You know, I have to deal with it. 
Like some days, somebody studies something like, and we need a therapist. Uh, we need it. Like, but, but you know, it's so, like, particularly if you're in the medical field and all these things, your mind is so primed to expect help to come from shrinks. That shrink needs the Holy Spirit. You understand? And we have the ultimate source of life within us. So in just understanding that you are the, you carry the presence of God. And so I, I, these days I tell people that I'm, um, I don't I don't I don't I don't look for healing. I carry healing because the healer is in you, and because the healer is in you, healing comes from you. You know that's what he was trying to get us to do. That you do greater works because why? He's seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and yet he's in you. That's the mystery of God. How can you be in me and you're heaven? But that's the power. That's mystery. Don't try to crack it. That code is a mystery. But understand that you have everything you need to succeed. So walk in the fullness of life. And I want us to pray if there are no questions. Yeah. Pastor, um, but I'm trying to break it down. Now some people think that some people have the gift of prayer while some struggle in prayer. How can we balance that? Because, because in this season, I just sense everybody saying the same thing to me that we need to pray as people. But some people think that for some people, it is it is a gift. It comes easy. While some people don't even pray. So how can we spark that? Okay, now something my husband used to tell me. He says, he says in the church, he says, um, they don't, when you want to talk to your wife, nobody's going to give you to call you on how to talk to her. And we are the bride of Christ. So talking to you is not a problem. Should not be a problem because we are the bride of Christ. The place of intercession and the place of prayer, there are two things. And intercession stands in the gap for himself, sometimes not even himself, for other people. But prayer is the only way you can talk with God. It's be, it is just saying, oh Lord, I'm so tired. You're praying. Now, if you don't talk to your wife, God forbid I'm that wife in a day. Not finished. God forbid I'm that wife. Because it's a relationship. And the first time you marry, I'll use that because that's what I know. The first time you marry, you're not that close. But as the days go by, you get closer and more intimate and closer. The first time you give your life to Christ, you're not that close like that. But as the days go by, the more you talk with him, the more you know what he likes, the more you know what he doesn't like. Now, I used to tell people that sin is from the more you know God, the more you're less likely to sin in the sense that I know what he likes, I know what he doesn't like. I'm doing it because I know he does not like it. Not because it is wrong, but because I know he doesn't like it. That comes from a relationship with God. And that relationship, I don't want to offend him because I love it when he's happy with me. It's the same thing about having a girlfriend, boyfriend. It's You know she's happy, and when she's happy, I bet there's no one like this thing. But when she's not happy, she's talking. Nobody wants that type of one. So what? what? We just do the right thing. It's the same thing. It's a relationship. The people that intercede, um, they have grown from that relationship of just praying from themselves, that's milk, to eating bones. That means I know I'm old enough, I'm old enough to start standing the gap for pearl, for mercy, because I know I have that capacity in me to do it. And you can always pick it up. It's not a it's a calling for some people, they do it without stress. But for every child of God, you must pray. It's the only way. I don't know any other way. It's the only way. It's the only way.